Now each week I do my analysis of the stock market for YouTube. This week I want to explain what I'm looking for. We'll go through it in a more relaxed way and I'll explain why I do what I do and we'll see how everything connects because it is the case that every market is somehow connected to another. So let's go through it step by step. All right, so I always start my analysis of the market each week with a look at the S&P 500. SPY is the exchange traded fund that represents the S&P and that's my favorite to look at. And so what I'm looking for is just a general overview. The S&P 500 represents the 500 largest companies in, well, arguably the world, but on the US stock market. And it is a great proxy for the overall market. It's not the only one and we'll show you as I go through this that there's other things to look for. So on screen right now, I've got the S&P ETF, SPY. This is the daily interval. So you can see up here in the top left, it says daily. And I can see that on the daily chart, we broke the downward trend line recently and we built a little rising bottom. So let's just explain what that means. First of all, anytime you have rising bottoms, it means the buyers are in control. So here, generally, you've got rising bottoms, the buyers are in control. Generally, in the last few months, the sellers have been in control of the S&P and that has meant prices have been going down. So what we had in the last week and a half or so is a switch from the sellers being in control to now the buyers being in control because we broke the downward trend line and we did so from a rising bottom. Now, there's still a lot of people that own stocks at higher prices, right? This is what we call resistance. And it's simply a ceiling that is built by the people that own or bought recently at higher prices. Imagine if you bought a stock two months ago, and let's say you paid $100 for it, and today it's trading at $90, how do you feel? You're not happy. And so when it gets back to 100, there's a good chance that you will sell because we humans are, are stupid like that. We say, oh, I paid 100, as soon as it gets back to 100, I'm gonna sell it and I'd be done. We don't care about whether it looks like it's going to 110 or whether it's at 90 going to 50. We always think about breaking even when we're losing, okay? So that's the first chart of the daily interval of the S&P. I like to look at the short-term chart as well. And so for that, I'm gonna click on the little 1M, which is a one month chart. And I can change the time frame. I usually look at a 60 minute chart, basically a one hour chart of the S&P and going back a month. So I can first assess who's in control. Sellers were in control here, right? We started to build rising bottoms and then the sellers were broken there on the 16th of March. And since that time, the buyers have been in control because we have rising bottoms. Now we're gonna come up to this ceiling price over here where twice in the past, the market stopped going up at that point. So investors have memory. They remember where stocks or markets topped out in the past, the recent past, the medium term past, the long term past. So the short term past is that the S&P topped out at 458 or so. And so when it gets to 458, in particular, when it rallies and goes up into 458, it's probably going to get stuck there. That's how resistance works. So what we know then is in the short term, the short term momentum is up, the buyers are in control, but we're coming into a ceiling price at around 458 that is gonna to prove to be a bit of a, a wall for the market to break through. Now, the other thing I like to look at is a longer term time frame. This is a very short term one. Let's look at a three year weekly time frame. So to do that, I just go to the 3Y, click on 3Y. This is all on the stock scores charts, it's all free to use. And now I can see the big picture. All right, so what does the big picture tell me? The buyers were in control for a very long time. From the bottom of the COVID crash in March of 2020, we were in a very strong upward trend where there was the buyers in control. And you will know that if you watch this video every week, I was bullish through that whole time period. It's not rocket science. The bottoms were rising, that's bullish, okay? Now in the last few weeks, few months even, We've had the sellers in control, but that's just been broken in the last two weeks because we've got now the little downward trend broken. However, 
On the weekly chart, we don't really yet have a rising bottom. So it's an early step toward the buyers taking control back in the long term. The buyers lost it for the last few months. They're trying to take it back, but still too early to say that the buyers in the long term are in control. So what we'll say then is that this is a neutral market long term. Short term, it's a bullish market. Long term, kind of neutral. What's going to happen? It's probably going to rise up to the highs around 480. Maybe in the short term, get stuck at 458, pull back a little bit, build a rising bottom, ultimately get back to that 480 level. Now what could happen, and this is something very real, is this little rally here of the last two weeks could be a sucker rally. It could top out at 460 next week, fall lower, and then we will have made a falling top on the weekly chart, which means the sellers are back in control. And if we then break this upward trend line after the formation of a falling top, well, then we could see some real sharp selling pressure back toward this level of support at around 350. So you get a sense of the different scenarios. If we can rally back to the old highs, we're good. If we fail to make new highs, we make a falling top, then the sellers are in control. Okay, so that's the overall stock market. Now, then I like to look at the NASDAQ, which is the tech market. And so I just go in here, I punch in QQQ, and there I can see pretty much very similar to what the NASDAQ is showing. I'll go through this a little more quickly, looking at the three-year weekly chart of the NASDAQ, very similar to the S&P. Don't really need to do more analysis there. Let's try the IWM, which is the small cap market. IWM is based on the Russell 2000. So it's 2000 small companies. They're not that small. Like I think the, the limit in market cap is around a billion dollars. So they can still be pretty substantial businesses, but they're nowhere near what an Apple or a Microsoft would be. All right, very different chart now. You know, think about this chart compared to what we saw with the S&P and the, and the NASDAQ. This has been in a downward trend for a while, right? Sellers were in control. The buyers just broke control in the last week, much like the S&P, but it did so after making a triple bottom. So it hit this 190 level, went a little bit below a couple times, but essentially bottoming out around 190, 191. And that's a good thing because it means that repeatedly the sellers were pushing that floor and then they couldn't push it down through it, right? The sellers and the buyers are winning or having this battle in the market and the buyers won, okay? And the sellers tried to win three times and they failed. And that's an important sign. So it actually looks better for the small cap stocks because we had that three battles and the buyers won overall. Are they out of the woods? No, because they still have to work through all of these people that own at higher prices. And there's a lot of people that own at higher prices in this range between 215 and 230 because the market went sideways there for a very long time. And in fact, if we look at a three-year weekly chart, you will see that the market went sideways and that 210 to 230 level for about a year, right? It tried to break out and failed. So my expectation is we probably move back into that zone and then we're gonna get stuck there. Now, with the small caps, we're seeing a chart that I think is better than the S&P or than the uh, NASDAQ. However, still got some overhead resistance. But what I know is that retail traders trade small cap stocks. Institutions do as well, but it's really about the retail trader, the person who's more into speculating and almost gambling in the stock market. And that's the market that I like to trade because that's where you get stocks that can go from $5 to $10 in a week. You can get stocks that go from $1 to $10 in a few hours, we see that once in a while. And so when I'm day trading, swing trading the market, I'd like to focus on those small cap stocks that are under $15, okay? They can still be extremely liquid. And, and as long as you have good risk management, safe to trade, key being you have to have good risk management, but you can get a lot more bang for your buck. You know, it's easier for a $5 stock to go to 10 than a $50 stock to go to 100, just the nature of, how these stocks move. So my expectation is that market is getting better. So where do we see action in that market? Well, I know that biotech makes up a big chunk 
of the um, small cap market. And I can see the biotechs have risen the last little while. As a person that watches the market every day, I know that they're getting better, but they're not great yet. And you can see that they are still below the downward trend line. We don't yet have rising bottoms. We're starting to get one. If we were to break this trend line now, that would be a break from a rising bottom. But notice my sentiment stock score is 40. That's way down here. We want that to be above 60. It's not yet moving up a lot. Now then you have uh, the cannabis sector. HMMJ is an ETF for the cannabis sector. Sorry, on Toronto. T.HMMJ. Okay, so there's the cannabis, marijuana life science as they call it. You can see the volume is starting to pick up a bit and it's breaking this little downward trend line, but it's still below the longer term downward trend line. If I look at the three year, I can see that it's still below that downward trend line. It's looking better, but it hasn't done it yet. Notice back here, it broke the downward trend, but there wasn't really a rising bottom yet. Here, it broke a downward trend from a rising bottom. So we're early stages of a turnaround in something like the cannabis sector. And what you can do is build a watch list on stock scores of all of the exchange traded funds that represent sectors. Just do a Google search, uh, sector ETFs, Canada, sector ETFs, US, you get a long list, you put them into a watch list, and then every week just go through the charts like I'm doing today, and you'll start to see where the money is flowing. All right, so that's the US market. Now let's jump over to the Canadian market. Now I know that the Canadian market is much more commodity based. So I just punched in the symbol T.XIU, you can see that there. I'm looking at a daily chart. I can see on the daily chart, a lot of volatility, which means a lot of uncertainty, but we just broke out to new highs. Very different chart than the S&P. If you look at the three-year chart, you can see that it has not really made a strong break of the upward trend line. It's gone sideways for four months, five months, and now breaking out to new highs. So the Canadian market looks a lot better. Makes sense why, with all the conflict going on in the world and in, in Ukraine, and the influence that that's having on commodity prices, Canada benefits from that. And so people are buying oil, bidding the price of oil up, gold, silver, wheat. These are all things that Canada has lots of, and that's why that market is doing better. And it even affects the Canadian banking stocks because the Canadian economy is better, the bank stocks do better, that sort of thing. If you were to look at Canadian technology, like Shopify, for example, it's not a very good chart. It's not in one of the good sectors. And Shopify is a big part of the TSX 60 uh, index. And so it's actually dragging down the index while the oil companies are, are pushing it higher. All right, so that's the TSX uh, long-term bullish. And if we look at you know just that short-term chart, we see that it's a little choppy, but generally bullish as well. All right, let's take a look at the TSX Venture, which is the micro cap stocks in Canada. And I can see that things are getting better. We're breaking the downward trend line, but there's no rising bottom yet. So I would call this neutral. It's broken a downward trend line, hasn't broken from a rising bottom. Now, I also like to look at currencies. So UUP is the US dollar, and I can see that it's trending up on the daily. I wanna look at the three year weekly chart. It's trending up. When did control change? The buyers broke the back of the sellers there and then did it again here and then broke up from a rising bottom there. That's when I became bullish. If you go back and watch my old videos, that's when I became bullish. And now it's in an upward trend. This is called an upward sloping channel. We're at the top of the channel. Usually you pull back and you just sort of keep gyrating along. Bullish on the US dollar. What about the Canadian dollar? Canadian dollar has lots of commodity interest, right? If commodities are doing well, even though the US dollar is going up, which usually means the Canadian dollar is going down because in this ETF, the US dollar is the most dominant force. You still see a break of the falling tops, a build of a rising bottom and a break of the downward trend line. You should start to move up there. All right, now we can look at commodities themselves, USO good proxy for oil. Who's in control? The buyers. When you run away from the trend line, you are emotional. So that's why the market pulls back to the trend line. We're running away again, again, we could pull back. And if we do, we'll be pulling back from a falling top. So oil getting a little toppy here. Doesn't mean you sell it because the linear trend is still intact, but it is building a falling top. And that is a sign that the sellers are starting to take some uh, control, the buyers are getting tired. 
Anytime a trend goes parabolic, where it curves up and away from the trend line, it means that the buyers are getting emotional. They're chasing. It's the fear of missing out trade. We don't want to get suckered into that. GLD is gold, GLD. And there you can see a similar situation. It went somewhat parabolic, backed off, came back. Let's look at the three-year weekly chart of gold. You can also see that it came into resistance at old highs. Remember what I said earlier, old highs, people remember that price gets back to that level, it's gonna get stuck and pull back, all right? So we're seeing all these very simple rules. I teach all these rules in my courses. You can learn them in a day, but to really understand them takes a lot of practice. And I do it every week. When I do these analysis of the markets in these videos every week, I'm just sticking to six concepts, support, resistance, optimism, pessimism, price volatility, and abnormal activity. If you can understand those six things, you can read any chart. What's in play here? Optimism, rising bottoms. Breaking pessimism, falling tops. Rising up to resistance where it got stuck. Pulling back and hopefully it'll compress in volatility and then we can break out and gold can go higher. If instead it breaks this upward trend line, then gold is going lower, simple. I'll do the work for you every week. I just wanted you to have a sense of how I approach the market so that you can pay attention to that. And if you've liked it, then make sure that you subscribe to the channel. I do these videos every week, they're free, and you'll get my sense of where the markets are going, short term, long term, but hopefully now you understand why. Like the video, subscribe, tell your friends, and hopefully next week, trade well.